Hello, welcome everybody. Welcome, welcome to this month's book club event. While everyone is joining, I would love for you to go ahead and find the chat. Tell us where you're calling in from, what number event this is for you, and what your favorite part of Turn Right at Machu Picchu was. Um, I know a lot of you have read it. I know quite a few people have found this event later, so maybe you haven't read it yet. So if you want to, you could also just write like what brought you here, what you're most excited about today. And I will share my screen for a second and tell you a little bit about the Nomadic Network. Okay, so my name is Erica Hackman and I help Nomadic Matt, who's on the call today, um, run his events community, his community events. And we started back in 2019 as a way of bringing travelers together to meet other like-minded travelers, to learn from them and to learn from experts in the industry about how to travel cheaper, longer, smarter, and more. We started um, with in-person events. We hosted over 40 before the pandemic ravaged in-person events and we had to pivot and go into online events. And actually a happy surprise out of this is that we were able to actually bring people from all over the world to speak to travelers all over the world. So it's been a really great way to connect resourceful travelers with other people that want to learn about travel resources. So a few things to keep in mind today. Feel free to turn your camera on. We actually love seeing your faces. This is a community event, though you will be muted for the first part of it. And then feel free to use the chat to connect, share questions, um, share your relevant experiences, anything you want. You could go ahead and write in the chat as Matt's speaking, because the first half will be a Q&A between Mark, our guest author, and Nomadic Matt. But then the second half will be a community Q&A. So if you want to pop your questions into the, into the chat, um, then I will call on you and you'll be able to ask your questions live. I just want to remind you that all of our speakers, including Mark Adams, who's here today, um, is they all do this out of the kindness of their heart and their passion for sharing their knowledge with you. And for that, we are so very grateful. So thank you so much. And also we are here to to learn, satiate your wanderlust, and have fun. Two little things I want to note um, for this replay, any past replays, and any future replays, you can join the Nomadic Mat Plus membership network. That's at nomadicmat.com slash NM plus. Plus you get a lot of other perks with that. And then I'd love to invite you to follow our Instagram, the.nomadic.network. That would be amazing. And then I just love to say like, Mark, thank you so much for being here. Here is how you can follow him. Um, his website is markadamsbooks.com and then Mark C. Adams on Twitter. So thank you so much. And we'll start our September book club now. Matt will go ahead and introduce Mark and I'll just put myself on mute. Hey everybody, how's it going? Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, Glad to have you here um, and, and especially happy to welcome Mark. Mark, thank you for, for joining us. Thanks for um, having me. I met Mark in New York when I, he agreed to do an interview for my website for this book like six years ago. One of the perks of having a website is it's my sneaky way to meet authors I, I really like. So that's uh, always my like, hey, would you like to be featured on this website? But can we meet up? Uh, and so we did. And we talked about this book. And, uh, you know, I, I not, I'm not just saying this because Mark is here. I actually really, really do love the book. And that's why I wanted to meet him all, all the years ago. It's, it is, and it was and is one of my favorite travel books. It's just highly engaging. I learned a ton from it. Um, uh, obviously well written uh, and just like really there was there was so much about Peru I learned from it that it just like I was like I have to go on all these walks Mark did like these seem really off the beaten path um, so today we're going to talk about that book uh, a couple of I'm mention some of Mark's other books too um, 
And yeah, so let's kick it off. Mark, welcome. Thanks for having me, Matt and Erica. Great, great. So um, first question is, what inspired you to write this book? Well, I was uh, originally a magazine editor. I worked at uh, places like GQ. I worked at Sports Illustrated. I worked at Life Magazine. Um, but one of my favorite jobs was I worked at National Geographic at a travel magazine called National Geographic Adventure, uh, similar to Outside Magazine. Uh, I also worked at Men's Journal, which was similar. Um, and I had just published a biography of America's first great health guru, uh, a book that got uh, really great reviews and sold about 14 copies. So I was uh, back at National Geographic Adventure in the spring of 2009 and trying to think of an idea for a book that might actually sell. And as I walked up and down the hallways, uh, I kept noticing these pictures of Machu Picchu. And every time we ran a story about Machu Picchu, uh, we got a really big response from readers. So I thought, you know, is there some sort of hook to write a book about Machu Picchu? So I started searching, you know, Machu Picchu rediscovery. Uh, and I realized that uh, we were just over two years out from the 100th anniversary of Hiram Bingham rediscovering Machu Picchu. And I thought, you know, if I hightail it, if I really put the pedal to the metal, I could write a book which I retrace the, the 1911 expedition of Hiram Bingham uh, to rediscover Machu Picchu and have it ready in time for the 100th anniversary. So that's what I did. Um, and uh, seems to have worked out okay, because here we are. Here, here we are. So how did you go about uh, planning your trip? Um, and one of the questions we have from someone who couldn't make the call, yeah. she, she wants to know about the title, like why do you, pick turn right and what made you want to turn right um uh, well the the way i planned my trip was what i always do with these books is i try to find uh interesting characters who are also knowledgeable about the area so i'm i'm always dealing with people who could end up in the book so uh those of you will probably remember Paolo Greer, the Alaskan, who was uh, quite evidently a very interesting character. So I got in touch with Paolo to talk to him about his, his research into, uh, for those of you who haven't read the book, finding a, a German who had perhaps found Machu Picchu long before the official rediscovery in 1911. Um, and I asked Paolo, I said, do you know anyone who can guide me? And he suggested his friend, John Lieber's. Um, and I got in touch with John and I, I went down uh, for a, uh, I always do a uh, reconnaissance trip to the place I'm going to be writing about to scope out locations and people. And I met John and I said, well, where should we go? And he said, well, you need to go to not just Machu Picchu, but Vicos and Vilcabamba and Chocacirao um, and various other sites around Cusco. So that's how I, I decided on the basic itinerary, retracing the voyages of, of Hiram Bingham. Um, as for turn right, um, I, I'm uh, sorry to say that uh, I just sat down one day and came up with a bunch of uh, potential names for the book, and that one just popped into my head, and uh, I rewrote one of the sentences in the book to match the title because my publisher liked the title. It's <laughs> a good, it's a good title. It gives that sense of like, you know, going off the the beaten path, you know, a bit like. Right. Right. It just, that's the thing about a title. It has to be pithy and it has to be eye-catching. Yeah. And uh, what you do a lot in the book. And so you, know, you didn't go down in just one one trip, right? This was multiple yeah. Uh, visits. Yeah, I did. Uh, I did a reconnaissance mission in August with my son. And that's when I met John the first few times. Uh, and then uh, basically the entire month of October 2009, um, I researched all the travel in the first maybe two thirds of the books or, or so. And then in uh, June, and I think some of July, 2010, um, I went back with John and we did the Inca Trail and, and saw the solstice and things like that. Uh, so basically three trips. Okay. Um, so what was, so after you go and you, and you get all these notes and such, mm -hmm. what's the writing process like for this book? How did you, you know, did you write a little bit 
uh, back in 2009 and then pick it up in 2010? Or did you just do all the trips, keep notes and just then write it all afterwards? Well, what I did was I, I got back after October 2009, you know, wrote in a frenzy um, because the way books work, you have to have them ready essentially a year before the publication date. So if we were going to publish on July 24th, 2011, which was the 100th anniversary of Hiram Bingham reaching Machu Picchu, uh, I needed to have the book ready. In this case, they gave me a little leeway. Uh, so by, I think, October 15th, 2010 was my due date. And I couldn't miss it. Some, you know, Sometimes it'll, the book business is still very much an old-fashioned handshake business. And if you're late, they'll say, oh, that's fine. But in this case, that wasn't going to happen. Uh, so I wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote, and I got to around April or May of 2010. And I realized that I needed more for the last third of the book. I didn't have a full book. Um, and that's when I got the idea of, uh, you know, having gone back and researched because, because Hiram Bingham did various trips as well. He did a 1912 trip, which led to his famous National Geographic cover story in 1913. Um, and if any of you happen to own uh, that copy of National Geographic. I know a lot of people's grandmothers keep them in the garage or something. I think it's worth at least $1,000 now. So uh, if you have one lying around, make sure you hold on to it. Um, but I, I, you know, I spoke to John and I said, because John had, had told me all this stuff about the solstice and the, the alignments with the sun and the stars. And I said, would it be worth going back for the solstice? And he said, yes, absolutely. And I said, could we do the Inca Trail? And he said, yeah, absolutely. So I said, okay, well, maybe this is the ending we're looking for. Um, and as it turned out, it it uh, it meshed perfectly with the narrative. So you so you did Machu Picchu and the Inca Trail at at the, as the last part of your your travels. Well, I did it twice. I did uh, a first trip to Machu Picchu and sort of left it as a cliffhanger. You know, there are things about the site that I still haven't figured out, and that sort of dovetailed with the controversy about uh, you know at that time, Yale University was in a lawsuit with uh, the government of, the, of Peru uh, because Peru wanted a bunch of artifacts back that Hiram Bingham had taken out. Um, and that was a way to explore the controversy about you know, who, who owns what and was Peru actually owed these artifacts. Did you know a lot about Peru in this area before you went? I knew some because you know, my wife's family is from Lima. So I had spent a lot of time in Lima, in the city. I'd never been to Machu Picchu. I'd never been to Cusco. Um, but that certainly, uh, you know, made it more intriguing to go down and spend a few months in Peru, definitely. Uh, did you meet up with any of your relatives while you were there? Oh, yeah. I saw my father-in-law. My father-in-law actually uh, was one of the people pushing uh, Yale to give the, the artifacts back. Um, he actually would turn up occasionally in NPR interviews and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, my, my in-laws keep an apartment in Lima and I stayed there for a few weeks. What was the most challenging aspect of all, all these treks, right? Like, um, some of them seem from the book, like I don't have it with me cause I'm in Slovenia. Uh, but my, from remembering this book, sort of some of the off the beaten one like uh seemed to be like you were really going through the jungle oh yeah yeah i mean you know there were there were you know i mean that that first day where we went down the valley i think it was the apurimac river and a little bit up the other side to get to chokikirao was just you know wiped me out it's really steep uh, and I was not used to it at all. I was in okay physical shape, but not nearly as good a shape as like John Lieber's was, or the the mule tears who uh, you know have grown up doing this sort of thing. So that was brutal. And then that that last part where we go down to Espiritu Pampa, uh, the real sort of lost city of the Incas, um, that was pretty vicious as well. I mean, that was that was some hard hiking, definitely. Uh, do you have a favorite like out of all the ruins? You know. Do you, do you have one site that is like, this is the one I like the best. This is one where everyone should go to. I mean, I don't know about favorite in terms of like, you know, I mean, obviously if, if you're gonna pick the, the coolest place, it's Machu Picchu. Um, there are, uh, you know, it used to be when I went there the first time, there were parts of the Machu Picchu site that were not, 
that busy. I went back a couple of years ago and places where you could just wander into, you know, I have to get a ticket to, you have to sign up for in advance because there's twice as many people going now as there were in 2009 when I first went. Um, and it was pretty busy then. Uh, but in terms of a place like a, a hidden gem, um, it's my understanding that not a lot of people are still going to Vitkos, which is, uh, you know, it's probably a day or two journey from Cusco and the ruins are just extraordinary, but there's nobody there. You know, you might even be able to just walk around by yourself. That's where the white rock is. Uh, that's where the, you know, incredible, uh, you know, Inca doorway where it looks like you're going inward in both directions. Um, that's where those where those rocks are. And then you could also stay at the um, the little hostel run by Uben Alcobos, the head muleteer and his family. I think his daughter Rosa has taken it over. I'm, I'm thinking about going to Peru early next year or so. I, I might well, check it out. I would definitely like to get off of beaten path a little bit, see some of these yeah. other ruins. Yeah. Um, well, Cusco itself has changed a lot. I mean, Cusco in 10 years has gotten a lot slicker. You know, there's a Patagonia on the main square in Cusco now. There's a North Face store. There's a Starbucks. And none of that was there 10 years ago. So catering to all those hikers. Yep. Time marches on in Cusco. Time does march on. Um, what is, actually, I'm going to back up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, in this book, um, you do a lot of research and yeah, I think at one point you mentioned that, you know, Machu Picchu is not like the real lost city. I think there was right. another city you mentioned. Yeah, uh, Espiritu Pampa, otherwise known as Vilcabamba. Um, you know, what happened was there were these Spanish chronicles kept by the missionaries uh, that were, you know, collections of, of stories, you know, histories and, and, you know, folklore and things like that. Uh, that were brought together and, and published and they were a little vague. So, you know, Bingham thought he could follow these, these chronicas to find this lost city of the Incas where he thought maybe there was this huge cache of gold. Um, but it, you know, in the end, there really was no secret treasure waiting for him at the end. It was just this uh, jungle city, you know, extraordinary in its own way and still has, has you know, they've only begun to scratch the surface in terms of digging it out archaeologically. Um, but, you know, Machu Picchu itself seems to have been probably like the summer home for the uh, Sapa Inca, the chief Inca emperor um, who had come from Cusco in the, you know, the summer down there, obviously being the, the winter in the northern hemisphere when it gets really rainy uh, in Cusco. So he would probably go out to Machu Picchu where things were a bit uh, more temperate because it's a at a lower altitude. So, I, so I asked that question because you have two other books, um, mm -hmm. Meet Me at Atlantis, and I forget the name of the book about Alaska. Um, uh, Tip of the Iceberg. Tip of the Iceberg. Also, really good books, everyone. You should, if you like to write at Machu Picchu, definitely pick up some of Mark's other books. Um, but it seems there's sort of like a quest and like a historical question you you ask like in, like me in Atlantis like you're trying to figure out did it exist and you know yeah. uh where could the location be you're retracing that uh trail and tip of uh to the iceberg so when you're thinking of a, a book what sort of drives drives you to um write something because it, it really seems like you go on these sort of epic you know yeah. big trips right i mean you went from yeah. all the way up the coast to the very end of alaska right I and mean, that's an epic trip right by boat too you know so what what drives you to write you know i think you, you hit the nail on the head when you said everything is a quest um you know when i was an editor and i still say this to people who are uh, just starting out as writers today any any long story is a mystery right in the sense that you want to know where is this story going? How are these characters going to change? And how is this all going to wrap up at the end? And, you know, with these three books in particular, not so much my first book, the biography, but, um, you know, I'm trying to weave together two or three or four narrative threads. Uh, that and, and I also try to work in a fair amount of humor so that people keep turning the pages so that they're sort of pulled along and they're wondering where this is weird. This is funny. 
this character is, is interesting, but where's all this going? And then finally, when you get to the last five or 10 pages, it starts to dawn on you and you're like, wait a minute, <laughs> I know where this is going. Um, and that, I think that comes from having uh, learned the craft through writing magazine stories where the pace is more boom, boom, boom. You know, you gotta keep people page to page, otherwise they'll just toss it aside. Um, so if the, if the books get a little breathless <laughs> sometimes, you know, if the quest narrative uh, takes over, that's why, because that's my, my background. But it also feels like these books require a ton of research. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. How much research, like, how much research went into to write a Machu Picchu? Did you, and, and did you have to do, like, go to, you know, Cusco Lima for firsthand documents, or was it? Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, I spent a lot of time up at Yale, where Hiram Bingham's papers are. Uh, I spent some time at libraries in Lima, uh, you know, dug out, you know, read everything I could, you know, dozens of books, journal articles, uh, interviewing experts, people like Johann Reinhard, who knows about the solstices and the, the alignments and things like that. Um, and sometimes by digging out the books, you can find other people to talk to, people who end up as characters in the book. And, uh, you know, sometimes you'll spend a week reading something in Spanish and translating it and you get one half of a sentence out of it. Um, and that's just the way it goes. You know, you can't know going in, um, which is why it's important to have a deadline because you did, if you don't have that gun to your head, uh, you could go on researching forever. You know, the research is, can be a lot of fun. So uh, it's very important to have a deadline if you're gonna get a project of this size done. What was your biggest obstacle in writing this book? Biggest obstacle, hmm. I mean, the, the biggest obstacle was in a lot of ways, uh, people thought this book has already been done. You know, Hiram Bingham wrote his, brought, uh, uh, wrote his version of it. There's a book called The White Rock by Hugh Thompson, which covers a lot of uh, similar territory, which is a very good book. Um, and, uh, you know, you would call people up and they would say, but this book has already been written. And that, that happened with Alaska too. Someone else had done a smaller, similar book 20 years ago. And my, my answer is always, yes, but uh, I'm going to do it differently. I don't say I'm going to do it better, although that's the implication. But, you know, every story can be told from a different perspective and, and in a different style. Um, you know, and then on top of that, it's always hard to find people who are interesting. You know, you can find someone who writes well, but is a total dud uh, when you're speaking to them face to face. Um, and if they don't come up off the page, if they don't come alive, uh, then you're really, you know, you can use them as background information, but you can't build scenes around them. And you certainly can't have them in chapter one and then coming back again in chapter seven and then chapter 13, because nobody cares. Well, John is definitely an interesting character. So he... John is a very interesting fellow. John comes to my house all the time. John's been here like four or five times. Oh, that's cool. I'm glad you said yeah. that. I talk to John fairly I... frequently. Yeah. So I'll one be... final question before I turn it over to the audience. I see yeah. in the chat, there's a ton of questions. What is the one thing you want the reader to take away from this book? From the Machu Picchu book? Yeah. Um, what is the one thing I want the reader to take away? Uh, just that Machu Picchu is a much more interesting place than, than somewhere to go and snap your Instagram photo. There's a lot more going on there, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I personally didn't realize there were so many other ruins in historical oh, yeah. sites around the area. I mean, because Machu Picchu gets, you know, all the attention. Um, and of course, logic would dictate there's other places around. Um, but yeah, that... That really opened up my eyes. Your yeah, book really fascinating story that. behind it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So great. So like a book talk, we're going to open it up to you. Uh, so you can, Erica is going to call on you and mm -hmm. we will unmute you. Um, and so you can sort of talk with Mark and ask, ask your question that way, rather than us just reading it. It's more fun. Um, so I've seen lots of questions and then I'm yeah. going to turn it over to Erica we will go through them all. Yeah, wonderful. Happy to facilitate this. Also, I wanted to say that even though it's not a great thing to just like go snap your Instagram photos, there are tons of people that go and snap Instagram photos with your book 
in Machu Picchu. <laughs> Sometimes they tag me. And that's another change at Machu Picchu in the last 10 years. They've got photo platforms built in now so that uh, people aren't, you know, blocking the, uh, the paths to snap photos the whole time. You're sort of told to go stand off to the side and get your epic shot there. That's not a bad idea. No, it's, it's you know, it's well organized. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so we have a many time book club attendee, Kim Lang, who has a question. Would you like to unmute yourself, Kim? Okay. Thanks for doing this, um, Mark. I really liked the book. I actually finished it last night, so um, really enjoyed it. I, I happened to see um, just this morning, I read an article uh, that was written a year ago by Nicholas uh, Stanziano, who is a co-founder and chief explorer SA Expeditions. I'd never heard of them, but um, John Levers is featured in the article and in the, the, um, the little video. And the article was a push to rebuild the Inca road, the um, yeah. Topic Nat Nyan, not sure Topic if I'm Nyan, saying that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and working in conjunction with the locals to draw more tourists. So I just wonder what your thoughts are on this, if you, if any. I think it's a great idea. They're up against uh, not just the, the national bureaucracies of, of, you know, not just Peru, but also Ecuador. And I think they may even go south into Chile or Argentina. I can't remember the entire route because it's, you know, the, the original Capac Nyan was a couple thousand miles. It was like the Roman road system, um, you know, but they, they do go through, through some fairly spectacular territory. John, you know, John filled me in with that. I did speak to Nick a few times and actually tried to get somebody to assign me a magazine story about their expedition. But if anybody has been paying attention, the magazine business has cratered in the last five years. Uh, so I couldn't get anybody to send me down there. Um, but it certainly sounds like a, a worthy and, uh, you know, potentially fascinating uh, uh, project because they are going into some areas where there is no tourism whatsoever. So, and there are stretches of the road, like in the book, when we go through Choca de Carpo with that great sort of white stone road through the, the mountain pass there, there are still so, a few stretches of that remaining that are just spectacular. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Kim. Um, I have a question, Mark. Mm -hmm. Do people now see you as an expert on Machu Picchu? A little bit. You know, I'm not really, uh, uh, what I always say to people after these books is I'm not a travel expert and I'm not uh, an expert on, uh, you know, Alaska, Atlantis, or, and believe me, I get a lot of Atlantis calls, uh, or Machu Picchu. Uh, I'm an expert on, on the trips I took. <laughs> so I'm an expert on writing. I'm an expert on narrative. Uh, so, you know, I'm not a scholar. I'm just someone who can take pieces and put them hopefully into an interesting story. You know, that right. said, can I hold a conversation on NPR about Machu Picchu or the BBC as, you know, things like that? Yeah, sure. Well, we do have quite a community of writers. So I'm just wondering, I mean, you sort of laughed when you said Atlantis, but since we're talking about Machu Picchu, has there been any like super unique quirky opportunities that have fallen into your lap after writing a book like this or maybe about Atlantis? Well, you know, certainly Atlantis more so because uh, the, the Atlantis fanatics tend to be a little more far out. Uh, the thing about Atlantis is it, more than the Machu Picchu book, it's a book about people who are themselves on quests, people who think that they can find Atlantis. And I go and, and visit the various sites that they have, have uh, singled out as, as possible locations for Atlantis. So I get a lot of emails from people like that saying, here's my 12,500 word explication of why I think I found Atlantis. And I just have to write back and say, I'm not an Atlantis expert, you know, try a philosophy professor somewhere. Uh, I get a lot less of that from Machu Picchu. From Machu Picchu, it's usually just people saying, uh, you know, hey, can you uh, uh, suggest an outfitter, uh, which I can't because I <laughs> haven't used an outfitter in 12 years. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, you know, that sort of thing I get a lot of emails about. That makes sense. Um, Linda, Linda has a question. Would you like to unmute yourself, Linda? Hi. Yes, I'll unmute, but I can't start video because I'm still okay. in my pajamas. I'm on the West Coast. <laughs> <laughs> Go 
Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. So I wondered why the author chose to go to Peru in the uh, South American winter. Was that when Hiram went? Or were you trying to be authentic? Or that's just when you had a chance to go? That is uh, A, when I had a chance to go. B, uh, John Levers told me, he said, uh, October and November are the best months. Second uh, choices would be March and April, you know, because in, in you know, uh, June and May through July is uh, great weather, but super crowded. August is the worst for crowding because the Europeans all take the month off and come over. Um, and in uh, the North American uh, winter, it's their summer and it can be very rainy in, in South America. So that's, that's how I ended up there in October. Um, I should point out that since you mentioned that you're wearing pajamas, the shirt I have on today is the shirt that I wore on the first day in 2009 when I went to Machu Picchu with John. So anybody, you do anybody, that on purpose. What's that? Did you do that on purpose? Well, I did because I was looking for a shirt and I was like, oh, that's topical. <laughs> I'm going to have some sort of uh, tie in. You're getting some thumbs up. <laughs> I get big thumbs up to the LL Bean drip dry travel shirts this thing that's <laughs> been through the ringer on every book and it's still ticking so i think you're the first person that dressed in costume to come to a tnn <laughs> book club <laughs> love it love it um jill has a question jill would you like to unmute yourself i have walked the trail and i remember hearing that a, a number of the steps and along the path were were very short um, because the Incans weren't large people. And I remember hearing that um, early on, it was Scandinavians, I, I don't know if it was Swedish or Norwegians, who had um, discovered, rediscovered the Incan Trail and, and patched up parts of it. And because they're so much taller, some of the steps end up being a lot taller. I'm short, so I definitely noticed this. Do you, can you tell us anything about that? Like early tourists were, were Scandinavian. I don't know about that. Um, you know, the, the Inca Trail uh, Bingham found on a, uh, a later uh, visit. I think it was, I don't know if it was 1912 or he also went back in, I think, 1914 and 1915 or maybe 15 and 16. I can't remember off, offhand. Um, you know, that was, that was part of his attempt to show that um, Machu Picchu was like the center of the Inca universe. Um, so that was that was the first rediscovery of the Inca Trail as we know it now. The Inca Trail didn't really become a, a tourist thing until, you know, fairly recently, the last few decades. Um, I don't know anything about Scandinavians rebuilding it. Um, you know, uh, you know, in terms of of how tall the steps are. Uh, you know, I do know that some parts of it are are rebuilt with new stone especially things that are steps. Um, but anybody who has not been on the Inca Trail, um, you know, it's not, it's not necessarily paved like a street or, you know, steps or things like that. A lot of it's just rock. A lot of it is just dirt. So uh, I honestly don't know. I don't know about the Scandinavian connection. Something to research and then write another book on. <laughs> I try to get 300 pages out of steps on the Inca Trail, but I might get a, a journal article out of it. <laughs> well, there you go. You'll have to credit Jill. <laughs> Jill can come with me. She can be a character. <laughs> um, we had a question from Denise Love, who is also a multi TNN book club attendee. Denise, would you like to unmute yourself? Sure. Hopefully you can hear me there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks so much. Um, I really enjoyed the book. I read it uh, actually a long time ago before this, this book club. This was one of my first uh, travel books uh, that I ever read. So loved it. Loved following it. I've always wanted to go to Machu Picchu. I still haven't quite made it there yet. <laughs> um, so I kind of asked, and I know Matt kind of covered this a little bit, but my question was, um, what was the best lesson you felt you learned from the trip? If somebody was going to recreate the journey, what do you think the best you know, lesson uh, you would tell them that they should follow I mean, or not the, follow, I guess. <laughs> the thing I always tell people is give yourself more time than you think you want to do it in. Because people will like fly into Cusco, get on the Inca Trail right away, or maybe, you know, give themselves a, a day to acclimate to the altitude. Um, 
you know, if they're doing the Inca Trail, they'll try to get through it as fast as possible and then take the train back that night. Um, and I always say, you know, spread it out. You know, don't rush. Um, this is not a long weekend activity. Uh, if you if they if someone is offering that five day Inca Trail trip, there are ruins along the route of the Inca Trail that are fascinating in and of themselves. You know, give yourself a second day at Machu Picchu. There's a lot to see there. Um, you know, there's you know the little town Aguas Calientes at the base of, of uh, Machu Picchu is now you know not a bad place to spend a couple of nights. So you know just build in enough time and build in enough time so you have a few days in Lima as well, because Lima is one of the greatest eating cities in the world. Uh, the food in, in Lima is just spectacular. So, you know, don't feel like you need to get down there and get out in four or five days. Just give it time. That would be my number one lesson. Excellent. Thanks so much. Thanks. I'm Thank with you, you on the eating. That's, you know, absolutely. You have me at Lima. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you. I mean, just a very curious follow-up question. What is your favorite kind of food in Peru that we should all try? Well, I, Peru sits near what may be the world's greatest fishery because of the Humboldt current off of uh, the Pacific coast there. Uh, so the seafood is amazing. Ceviche is incredible. Uh, but you know, there's Lomo Saltado, there's Anticuchos, um, which is marinated and grilled beef heart. There is the famous uh, Peruvian chicken uh, served with the famous Peruvian green sauce. You know, I mean, you can you could go to Peru and not eat the same thing twice for a month. It really is one of the world's great cuisines because it's it's got the Asian influence, it's got the Spanish influence, and it's also got the the native Andean influence with the three hundred kinds of potatoes and all that. So, I mean, you can eat spectacularly well for not a lot of money in Peru. So, I like the sound of that. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> you can live well in Peru and not a lot of money. That's awesome. I also have a question since your wife is from there. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and you've explored it extensively. Um, what's a place, if people want to go to Machu Picchu, mm -hmm. what's a secondary place that they should go and look around um, that maybe isn't as famous as Machu Picchu that you have loved? Not as famous as, you mean like near Cusco or within the Within Peru. Um, let's see. I mean, Chukicurau is certainly worth a visit. Um, it's, uh, it's sort of the second lost city of the Incas in terms of, of tourism. And because it's hard to get there, uh, it's much, much, much less crowded than Machu Picchu because um, it does require a day hiking down and a day hiking up essentially to get there. You know, they keep talking about building a funicular, but that's never going to happen. Uh, <laughs> so I would, I would definitely check out Chogikirau. Uh and a city I've never been to, but which is supposed to be absolutely spectacular is Arequipa. You know, where supposedly not only is that the the most Peruvian of Peruvian food in Arequipa, uh, but uh, according to uh, Mario uh, Vargas Llosa, uh, they speak the purest Spanish in all of South America. So. I haven't been down there to test it out, but that seems to be the case. Wow. Yeah. We have a question from Scott. Scott, do you want to unmute yourself? Hi, thank you for being here. I really liked your descriptions of how everything was connected, all of the sites and the mountains and rivers. And my question was just, do you remember where in Peru you saw the most wildlife and maybe what you encountered? You know, I don't recall seeing a ton of wildlife in Peru. I mean, I, I wrote a book about Alaska and you're like basically like tripping over bears and moose and stuff in Alaska. Uh, you know, in, in the part of Peru I was in, you know, obviously it would be very diff in, different in a place like the Amazon, uh, but you're, you're dealing mostly with uh, snakes, reptiles, small mammals, that sort of thing. There is the Andean spectacle bear which is a, a famous sort of mascot of the Machu Picchu area, but I never saw one in the wild, unfortunately. I wish I had. Oh God. The idea of tripping over bears is not, is not oh so my great. God. The bears are everywhere in Alaska. It's crazy. Wow. Okay. Uh, <laughs> note to self. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we, like I said before, we do have a lot of writers and aspiring writers. And so I just, um, 
a question that usually comes up on these book talks is like, how as a traveler, do you balance writing with traveling? So like, do you, what's your routine when you're on the road so that you're able to capture everything that you want in your book? Well, there's, you know, the, the writer Christopher Isherwood had a famous quote where he said, I am a camera with the aperture open, meaning everything he saw was material. And that's essentially the, the attitude that you have to have if you're going to go and write one, a book like this, you just, just, you hit the ground. And from that moment, you're not on vacation. You're not enjoying yourself, which is a, a sort of a misconception that some people have about these sorts of things. Uh, you're a reporter. So you're there, you're meeting people, you're talking to people, you're writing things down, you're seeing things, you're digging things up, you're visiting libraries, you're reading books all along the way, and you're taking notes, 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 notes. Um, because you have to get it all while you're there on the ground. Um, in terms of structuring something like a long piece of travel narrative, the thing I always tell people to remember is you're not writing about places, you're writing about people, right? I mean, there's nothing less interesting than just hearing lots of descriptions of a place, you know, sunrise, and here's what I had for breakfast, and this is what the buildings were like. You know, if, if you're not talking to people and giving a flavor of the people who live in a place, uh, it's very difficult to, to pull off a narrative, so. Right, and then just uh, also, I was wondering if you had some piece of advice for aspiring writers or travel writers before I kick it back to Matt. Uh, the, you know, people contact me sometimes and they say, you know, I'd love to do what you do. And it turns out what they really want to do is, uh, go on NPR and talk about themselves. Uh, because I, when I ask, I say, well, what do you read? I say, what are, what are your favorite travel books? And they're like, well, I don't really read travel books. And if you don't read dozens and dozens and dozens of travel books or any kind of book, you know, whether it's novels or, or, you know, investigative journalism or whatever, uh, you're not going to know what you like, and you're not going to know what what sort of meshes with your your writing personality. So you got to read, 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 read before you start sit down to write, 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 write. Uh, that's the key thing. Yeah, that's awesome. I just a quick anecdote about Nomadic Matt is right after uh, we all went into COVID lockdown. He posted a photo of many bookshelves and got a lot of backlash because people thought he was like out at a bookstore or at a library, but that was in his house. He just has like five bookshelves back to back filled. And so he had to defend it saying like, no, this is actually inside of my apartment. Like I am an avid, avid reader. And that's the biggest piece of advice he always tells people to just to, before I kick it back to Matt, just love to share that story because it was just a hilarious a hilarious moment in his history i feel like <laughs> people don't people it's just well i had a whole room that was just all books um and people were like why are you at a bookstore you know i was like no right. this is my house <laughs> let me zoom out a little more you can see my empty wall i had hoped to go to my office today where i also have a much better background than my bedroom here where i'm sitting on the bed but there's a a monsoon coming through in uh, New York. So I'm trapped at, uh, at home today. Uh, the shirt was good enough. A literary background for you. <laughs> the shirt, the shirt was good enough. See? <laughs> Matt, uh, had when when to you, say. Mark, when you uh, travel, do you keep a notebook with you? How do you oh, yeah. remember what, what is your experience? Like? Not only do I keep a notebook, I always use, uh, if anybody uses these, write in the rain notebooks, which are waterproof paper, because not only does uh -huh. it rain a lot or snow a lot or whatever, but uh, if you're someone like me, you perspire a lot. <laughs> if you perspire a lot and you're not writing in pencil, which I also usually do for the same reason, uh, it can sweat right through the pages and blot everything out. So uh, waterproof notebooks from write in the rain are, are your friend, yeah. Thank you, Kim, for holding up the photo. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so we, before we wrap up a little, little bit here, um, what, what are some three future projects you got going on? Uh, well, is there I, another book in the works? I uh, am supposed to be in India, in the Himalayas, uh, or was supposed to be as of March of 2020. 
uh, retracing uh, 1968 uh, pilgrimage that the Catholic monk Thomas Merton made to uh, explore uh, Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, which was a fascinating trip he took. He met the Dalai Lama and he traveled through the highest mountains in the world. And he had this incredible epiphany at the end of his journey, journey at this uh, Buddhist site in, in Sri Lanka, where he, he basically says, uh, I've, you know, it, it's, it's almost like he achieved enlightenment. And he's like, uh, I finally understand why I came here and I can't wait to get back to America and explain it all. And then he goes to Bangkok and he slips and falls in a shower and is electrocuted. So we never find out, you know, what this amazing uh, epiphany he has was. So part of the book, sticking with the quest theme, would be to follow his steps and uh, figure out everything that he saw and, and felt on his trip. Uh, obviously, uh, right now is not a great time to be going to the Himalayas. So I'm hoping to uh, get that one uh, going as soon as possible. What inspires these these stories, right? Because like I get there was a peg for uh, Chinrai at Machu Picchu, mm -hmm. that year. or like the Alaska trip, where you're, you know this trip where you're like I'm gonna uh, go in this guy's footpath. Like how do you find right. these stories and then go I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna retrace that one. Right. Well, again, it comes back to the place. Is it a place that people are going to be interested in? You know, Alaska, sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, Machu Picchu, sure. The Himalayas, sure. Um, and who are the people I can talk to? And, you know, in, in, when I'm retracing something, uh, as I did in Machu Picchu in Alaska and, and will be doing in the Thomas Merton book, uh, how interesting is that person? Because it's going to be a mini biography of that person as well. Um, and Merton is probably the most fascinating per person I've, I've written about yet. So I'm really looking forward to getting into that one. Interesting. Um, I hope it, hope the world clears up for many reasons, but one of them is so we can have you on again. <laughs> you and me both and my publisher, Matt. Yeah, all of us. Um, how long do you think that, like, are you going to do that in one trip or will you go back multiple times? I honestly don't know. Before COVID, I probably would have said two trips. I probably would have said, you know, I'll do, you know, Kolkata, Delhi, Dharamsala, uh, Kanchenjunga, uh, you know, Bengal, uh, Sikkim, the kingdom of Sikkim, and then come back and then maybe do like Nepal and Mount Kailash uh, as the second trip. Now, I might just try to cram it all in, in, you know, two months, two and a half months or something, because who knows what could happen if I'm going to get another chance to come back. I mean, it, you know, COVID would have been awesome if I had like just finished all the reporting and suddenly had nowhere to go, you know, and was forced to sit in my my office for a year and, and you know, just polish my manuscript. Uh, so the, the timing would have been a lot better that way. Uh, but, uh, you know, we're going to have to play this one by year. Right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, I was going to write a book this year too, because um, this year's the 15th anniversary, I guess, of when yeah. I went backpacking the world. So I was going to use that as sort of my hook and yeah. retrace my original steps. Ah. Um, I was going to do it over 18 months, um, a little shorter this time, yeah. but really just kind of talk about how places and, and travel changes as, you know, you get older, you know, yeah. obviously I'm not sleeping in the dorms you know, like I was in, uh, <laughs> when I was 25. So just sort of use that as my hook and now that's you know maybe i will secretly follow you while you're writing your book and i'll write a book about you writing your book ah uh, that'd be very meta that would be super meta um well we'll, we'll talk we'll talk offline about it um <laughs> but mark i want to thank you so much for uh being here and you know talking to us and answering everyone's questions uh again you know if, if you haven't picked up this book folks uh it is one of my favorite travel books and I read a lot of travel books. Um, you know, so it still remains in, in my top, top 10. Uh, maybe, maybe, you know, uh, I, I think, the, actually, I think in a sunburn country is probably my favorite um, by Bill Bryson simply because <laughs> uh, 
that was the book that got me into travel. So it was like sentimental, uh, sentimental to me. Um, but you know, definitely top three mark. Okay, maybe top two. All right, maybe time to go. Um, <laughs> but thank you so much for coming. A little virtual round of applause for thank you. Uh, Mark. Um, again, pick up his book and definitely check out his other books. Uh, Meet me in Atlantis um, and Tip of the Iceberg, which is about Alaska. Atlantis is about finding it, Atlantis. And yeah. clearly he did because that's why he's super famous now. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, if, uh, if I didn't get to your question, if you have a question you wanted to ask, just go to my website at markadamsbooks.com. Ignore the fact that it looks like something that was designed in the GeoCities tripod era. Uh, I'm going to update it soon. Uh, and there's a, you can email me through there and I will get back to you. So just, uh, I think the email address might be turnrightmp at gmail.com. And if you have a question, just shoot me an email and I'll get back to you. I promise. Awesome. Well, before you all leave, uh, Erica has a very, very brief uh, um, closing about our next book event next month and uh, some other little things. Yeah, first of all, I would just like to say I'd love to give away one of Mark's books. So how I'm going to do that is via Instagram. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> I know you're not there. I am but there. If you'd like I'm not to... There much. If you'd like to uh, hop onto Instagram and share a story just about this event um, and what what it means to be meeting an author, uh, that would be great. Just tag our account and I will pick someone by the end of the day. So to get any of Mark's books, you get to choose which one. Um, mm -hmm. And then I would love to share my screen one more time. Okay, well, there's Mark again. Um, for those of you who said that this was your first event, I'd just like to share with you where you could find all of our other events. We currently have dozens um, planned and we love planning these for you. So at thenomadicnetwork.com slash events, you can find and register for any of these events. We'd love to have you. Uh, we currently have three different kinds of events. One is a book club. The second one is a presentation. They're on topics all about travel or content creating. And then the third kind of event is our happy hours where you get to meet like-minded travelers virtually and hopefully in person soon, hopefully. Um, our next book club is by Lola. Uh, it is October 6th at 12 p.m. EST. Uh, and it's her new book in every mirror. She's black and it's going to be amazing. It's about to come out so you can register for the wait list to get the book. I believe it ships in a week and that'll give you enough time to read it before our discussion with her next month. We're very excited to have her. And then I, if you found this valuable, I would love to invite you to be a part of our Nomadic Map Plus membership network. You can find that all at this QR code or nomadicmap.com slash NM plus. Uh, along with the membership, you also get access to all of our TNN replays, past and future, monthly giveaways. Today we're drawing for last month. The giveaway was a free domestic flight. So we do monthly giveaways. You get free signed books, guides, an exclusive Facebook group to be a part of and access to our courses and lots of one-on-one, -on -one, well, few on one times with Nomadic Matt himself. So that's a really cool thing that we offer. And then I would just love to say thank you so much for being a part of this community. Honestly, these book clubs are so much fun because you guys show up. So thank you for being a part of our community. Thank you for being avid readers. Thank you for being so engaged and bringing your awesome questions. I can't wait to see what you post on Instagram. And Mark, thank you so much for being here. It is such an honor to have such an incredible author that I've been hearing about, reading about for years and years. Matt has been talking incessantly about your books, even though he says it's like two Not or three on his list. Books. 
I, I mean, Bill Bryson too, but like you're somewhere way up top because I, I've been seeing it on his list, like for years and years and years. So don't worry. Matt, um, I've been but, a, a big supporter. So I am de deeply grateful for that. And I'm, I'm deeply grateful for coming out. Whoops. Yeah. Thank you so yeah, Mark, much. Thank you. Everyone give uh, Mark a round of applause and uh, we'll see you next month. Have a good thank day, you, everybody. Everyone. Bye. Bye.